For countless generations, the Inuit have mastered an incredible skill, finding drinking water in one of Earth's harshest environments. When temperatures plummet to minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit, you can't simply light a cozy campfire or scoop up any random snow for a drink. Getting water in the Arctic requires careful knowledge, technique, and understanding of the environment. The process might sound straightforward. Just melt some snow or ice, right? But that's far from the reality. Let's first clear up a common misconception about snow in the Arctic. It's not just free water waiting to be consumed. Many people assume you can simply scoop up some snow and eat it, but this seemingly innocent act could actually put your life at risk. The Inuit people have learned through generations that consuming raw snow can lead to serious health issues. First, there's the obvious risk of bacteria and viruses lurking in the snow. While the Arctic might seem pristine, snow can harbor various microorganisms that could make you seriously ill. But here's where it gets really interesting. Eating snow can actually cause dehydration. It sounds counterintuitive, right? Your body has to use precious energy to melt the snow and warm it to body temperature. When you're already trying to stay warm in sub-zero temperatures, this extra energy drain could be dangerous. The Inuit have developed a keen eye for selecting the right snow for drinking water. Fresh snow is their go-to choice, as it contains fewer contaminants than older snow that's been sitting around collecting dust, dirt, and who knows what else. They specifically avoid snow that's been on the ground for extended periods, as it tends to accumulate all sorts of unwanted additions. Now, here's something that might make you chuckle. While it might seem obvious to avoid yellow snow, and yes, that colourful warning usually means exactly what you think it does. There are other, less obvious types of snow to watch out for. Windblown snow, for instance, can be particularly tricky. While it might look perfectly clean on the surface, these snowdrifts often hide layers of compacted snow underneath that can trap all sorts of debris and contaminants. Think of windblown snow like a deceptive layer cake. The top might look fluffy and inviting, but those lower layers could be hiding some unsavoury surprises. These compressed layers not only make the snow harder to melt, but could also contain concentrated pollutants that have built up over time. The Inuit's ability to read these subtle differences in snow conditions has been crucial to their survival in the Arctic. The selection process becomes even more critical when you consider that in temperatures well below freezing, you can't afford to waste precious energy melting snow only to find out it's unsuitable for drinking. This is why the Inuit's knowledge of snow selection isn't just about avoiding contamination. It's about efficient use of limited resources in one of the world's most unforgiving environments. When it comes to sourcing drinking water in the Arctic, the Inuit actually prefer ice over snow when they can get it. While ice might be harder to harvest, it often provides a purer source of water. But don't be fooled, not all ice is created equal and the Inuit have developed fascinating methods to identify the best ice for drinking. Clear ice is the gold standard in the Arctic. It forms in layers and tends to be much cleaner than its cloudy counterpart. Cloudy ice, which contains those pesky air bubbles and impurities, is usually passed over when better options are available. It's not necessarily unsafe, but why settle for less when you're looking for the perfect drink? Here's where things get really interesting. The Inuit have discovered that ice actually talks to them. Well, not literally, but they've learned to interpret the sounds ice makes when struck. Clear, pure ice produces a sharp, ringing tone, almost like striking a crystal glass. On the other hand, if you hit cloudy ice, you'll hear a duller thud, thanks to all those trapped air bubbles muffling the sound. It's nature's way of giving the Inuit a quality test they can rely on. When it comes to choosing between sea ice and freshwater ice, there's no contest. Freshwater ice wins hands down. Sea ice might look tempting, but it's loaded with salt and minerals that can make your taste buds revolt. While it's technically drinkable in small amounts during emergencies, you know, those dying of thirst in the Arctic kind of situations, it's far from ideal. Think of sea ice like that relative who overstays their welcome. Fine in small doses, but you wouldn't want to deal with it every day. This careful selection process might seem excessive to those of us who can simply turn on a tap. But in the Arctic, choosing the wrong ice could mean the difference between a refreshing drink and an unpleasant or even dangerous experience. 
The Inuit's ice selection techniques have been refined over countless generations, proving that sometimes the old ways are the best ways. Now that the Inuit have carefully selected their snow or ice, they face an even bigger challenge, melting it in an environment where even your breath freezes in midair. Starting a fire at minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit isn't exactly a walk in the park, and they've developed some remarkably clever methods to tackle this problem. One of their most ingenious solutions involves using blubber lamps. These aren't your typical scented candles. They're specialised lamps fuelled by seal or whale blubber from previous hunting expeditions. The Inuit discovered that animal fat, when burned with a wick, creates a surprisingly steady and efficient heat source. Not only do these lamps provide light in the long Arctic darkness, but they're also perfect for the patient process of melting ice and snow into drinkable water. But sometimes they need something more powerful than a blubber lamp, and that's where fire starting skills become crucial. In an environment where everything seems designed to prevent fires from starting, the Inuit mastered the art of creating flames from nearly nothing. Using flint and steel, they'd create sparks that could ignite dry materials like moss, grass or birch bark. Of course, finding these materials in the Arctic is about as easy as finding a sunbather in winter. They're incredibly scarce and precious resources. The melting process itself requires careful attention. Too much heat too quickly can affect the water's taste while too little heat means waiting longer for that precious drink. The Inuit have perfected this balance through generations of practice. They've learned exactly how to position their melting pots over the heat source for optimal efficiency. Think about how frustrating it is when your microwave takes an extra minute to heat your coffee. Now, imagine having to spend hours melting ice just to get a drink of water. This process has taught the Inuit incredible patience and resource management. Every drop of fuel needs to be used efficiently, and every moment of heat needs to be maximised. The entire process, from starting the fire to having enough drinking water for a family, could take several hours. But in the high RSH Arctic environment, this time-consuming process isn't just about getting a drink, it's a crucial Sioux survival skill. When you're trying to melt ice in the Arctic, finding shelter from those fierce winds isn't just a matter of comfort. It's absolutely essential. With winds that can reach speeds of 60 miles per hour, any exposed flame would be snuffed out faster than a birthday candle in a hurricane. This is where the Inuit's legendary igloo building skills come into play. The igloo isn't just a shelter. It's an engineering marvel that creates a surprisingly cozy space for melting water. Here's something that will blow your mind. While the outside temperature might be a teeth-chattering minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, the temperature inside an igloo can reach a relatively balmy 32 degrees Fahrenheit just from body heat alone. Add a blubber lamp or small fire and you've got yourself a rather comfortable spot to work in. The igloo's dome shape is perfect for trapping heat while letting smoke escape through a small vent at the top. But the Inuit don't always have time to build an igloo, especially when they're on the move. In these situations, they become masters at finding natural windbreaks. Large rocks, cliffs or ice formations become temporary shelters where they can set up their water melting operation. It's like finding the perfect spot at a windy beach, except instead of trying to keep sand out of your sandwich, you're trying to keep your water source from refreezing. Let's talk about timing. Melting enough water for a family isn't a quick process. For a family of five, it could take anywhere from two, three hours to melt enough snow or ice for their daily needs. That's assuming everything goes smoothly and they've found good quality ice or snow to start with. It's a bit like making homemade soup. You can't rush it if you want good results. Inside their shelters, the Inuit would often set up multiple melting stations to maximize efficiency. While one pot of snow is melting, they might be preparing the next batch or storing what's already melted. It's a continuous process that requires careful attention. Let the water cool too much and it freezes again. Heat it too quickly and you waste precious fuel. The end result of all this careful preparation and patience. Some of the purest water you could imagine. When you think about it, this water started as Arctic snow or ice, formed from pristine precipitation in one of the least polluted places on Earth. Modern water treatment plants might give us safe drinking water, but they can't match the crisp, clean taste of properly melted Arctic ice. It's like the difference between store-bought tomatoes and ones grown in your garden. 
There's just no comparison. While melting snow and ice was the most reliable way to get water in the Arctic winter, the Inuit also knew about some remarkable natural water sources that made life a bit easier during certain times of the year. One of the most fascinating discoveries they made was the existence of unfrozen water beneath the ice. Sounds impossible, right? But it's true. Despite Arctic temperatures that could freeze just about anything, some water sources managed to stay liquid year-round. This phenomenon occurs because of geothermal heat and pressure from above, creating pockets of unfrozen water beneath the thick ice layer. The Inuit became experts at locating these hidden treasures, passing down the knowledge of reliable water sources from generation to generation. These weren't just random spots they stumbled upon. The Inuit developed what you might call a mental map of their territory's water sources. Each community maintained detailed knowledge of where to find these springs, and some of these sources have been in continuous use for over 1,000 years. That's longer than many famous European castles have been standing. Think about that. While medieval Europeans were building Notre Dame, Inuit people were already familiar with their local spring water sources. To access these underground water sources, the Inuit would carefully chip through the ice, creating holes that could be reopened whenever needed. They became experts at identifying the subtle signs that indicated water below, slight depressions in the snow, areas where the ice formed differently, or spots where steam might rise on the coldest days. During spring, their options expanded even further. As temperatures rose, seasonal springs would begin to flow, providing fresh water without the need for melting. These springs were like nature's water fountains bubbling up through the ground and providing a welcome alternative to the time-consuming process of melting ice and snow. But here's the catch. While these natural water sources were incredibly valuable, they weren't always accessible. The Inuit were often on the move, following seasonal hunting patterns or searching for better resources. This meant they couldn't rely solely on known water sources and had to maintain their skills in ice and snow melting. It's a bit like having a favourite coffee shop. Sure, it's great when you're nearby, but you still need to know how to make coffee at home. The Inuit's ability to find and remember these water sources shows just how deeply they understood their environment. Each spring, each underground water source, represented not just a convenient water supply, but a vital link in their survival strategy. This knowledge, passed down through countless generations, became part of their cultural heritage as valuable as any Fizz and Eichel tool. Once the Inuit had their precious liquid water, keeping it from freezing again became the next challenge. After all, nobody wants to repeat the whole melting process every time they need a drink. The solutions they developed were both practical and ingenious, making use of every resource available to them. Animal skins, particularly those from seals and caribou, became their go-to water containers. These weren't just random choices. These animals had developed natural insulation to survive in the Arctic, and their skins retained some of these insulating properties. The Inuit would carefully prepare these skins, creating water pouches that were not only durable, but also naturally resistant to freezing. The layers of fat and fur worked like nature's thermos, keeping the water liquid for surprisingly long periods. Inside their igloos, the Inuit created designated storage areas for their water containers. The igloo's design, which could maintain temperatures just above freezing, provided an ideal environment for water storage. It's like having a refrigerator that's trying its best not to be a freezer, keeping things cool without turning them into ice blocks. When traveling, the Inuit got really creative with their water storage. They would often keep their water containers inside their clothing, using body heat to prevent freezing. Imagine carrying your water bottle in a specially designed pocket next to your skin, not the most comfortable solution, but definitely effective. This method ensured they had liquid water available even during long journeys across the frozen landscape. Sometimes they would use containers made from wood or bone, though these weren't as common as the skin pouches. These containers required extra care and usually needed to be kept in sheltered spots where the temperature stayed a bit warmer. The Inuit would often wrap these containers in furs or skins for additional insulation. The whole system of water storage was a testament to their resourcefulness. Every material was chosen for its insulating properties, every storage location carefully selected. 
They understood that in the Arctic, maintaining liquid water was just as important as obtaining it in the first place. It's similar to modern camping. It's not just about finding water, but also about having a reliable way to carry it with you. Each family would typically maintain several water containers of different sizes, using larger ones for storage at their camp and smaller ones for traveling. The containers needed regular maintenance, checking for leaks, replacing worn out sections, and ensuring the insulation remained effective. It was a constant process of care and attention, but one that meant the difference between having liquid water readily available or facing the time-consuming process of melting a G-ice all over again. Today's Inuit communities blend traditional knowledge with modern technology, creating innovative solutions for their water needs. While their ancestors relied solely on ice harvesting and melting, contemporary Inuit settlements now have access to community water stations, though they haven't completely abandoned their traditional methods. Modern water infrastructure in the Arctic faces unique challenges. Keeping water pipes from freezing is like playing a constant game of cat and mouse with the cold. Engineers have developed a fascinating system where water pipes are housed in heated conduits called utilidors. Think of them as underground tunnels that keep the pipes warm enough to prevent freezing. These utilidors are carefully maintained and monitored to ensure the water keeps flowing even in the most brutal winter conditions. For those living outside the reach of water mains, there's the water taxi service. But forget about yellow cabs. These are specially equipped snowmobiles that deliver water to remote households. It's like having a pizza delivery service, except instead of hot pizza, they're bringing you life's most essential resource. This modern adaptation shows how the Inuit continue to evolve their water collection methods while maintaining their connection to the land. Speaking of water usage, Here's an interesting statistic. The average Inuit household uses about 20 gallons of water per day, compared to 100 gallons used by households in southern Canada. This dramatic difference reflects both the challenges of obtaining water in the Arctic and a deep-rooted cultural understanding of water conservation. When it comes to storage, traditional sealskin water bags are increasingly being replaced by modern plastic containers. While these new containers might lack the cultural significance of their traditional counterparts, they're more practical for everyday use and easier to maintain. However, many Inuit families still keep traditional containers, using them during hunting trips or special occasions. Ice harvesting hasn't disappeared entirely. Many Inuit still prefer the taste of melted ice from traditional sources. The difference is that now they often use electric kettles or stoves for melting rather than blubber lamps. It's a perfect example of how modern convenience meets traditional preference. This combination of old and new methods ensures that the Inuit can maintain their cultural connection to the land while benefiting from modern technology. This evolution of water collection and storage methods tells a larger story about the Inuit's ability to adapt while preserving their cultural heritage. They've embraced modern solutions where practical, but maintained traditional knowledge and practices that have served them well for generations.